It is our customary procedure to spend the next few moments in silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to rebound if necessary. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning the things we note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now we finished Galatians on Friday, but today we're going to continue with what I left off with on Sunday of last week, and that's the gift of pastor-teacher. And we all have to come to understand what the gift of pastor-teacher entails so that you can know how to evaluate a pastor-teacher. And it is important that you know how to do so. So we've studied, in part, the function of the pastor-teacher and his functions. And uh, soon we will study a lot of the Old Testament heroes. We will study Joseph, we will study Moses, we will study David, and we will study them in terms of how they use the faith rest drill. That's upcoming next week. But as per now, we need to uh, finish with the gift of pastor-teacher. And I'm teaching this. It is new stuff, but I'm teaching it. Last week I wasn't able to put it on the Internet, so I'm putting it on the Internet for those thousands, evangelistically speaking, who wish to hear me. That was a joke. Thousands, evangelistically speaking. The evangelists uh, puff up their numbers. So we've studied the concept of pastor, teacher, and his functions. And we've already made some very important points, such as God makes war against the arrogant believer, but he gives grace to the humble believer. And the only way a pastor can be a great pastor is to have humility. If a pastor does not have humility, he'll never make it behind a pulpit. And that's because God makes war against the arrogant pastor. But he gives grace to the humble pastor. So a minister is not a special man, first of all. What you need to know about a pastor teacher? A pastor teacher is not a special man. I'm a man like every other man. And every pastor who has the gift of pastor teacher is a man like every other man. And he's not to be a self-righteous man. He's not to be a phony man to act like he's sinless because he's not. And he's not to live a life that is sterile because the pastor teacher is not sterile. The pastor teacher has an old sin nature like everyone else. So every minister is a product of grace, the grace of God. And in the grace of God, we see our helplessness. We see our hopelessness. We see our uselessness. And we see that even in our salvation. The only way we're saved, you see, we're born into this world spiritually dead. And the only way we're saved is that God the Holy Spirit reveals to us the gospel. And He does it. God the Holy Spirit does it. We're helpless ourselves to understand it. And then we understand it and then we accept it or reject it. If we accept it, then we have eternal life with God because we believed in Christ. But all of it is the work of Christ. So there's helplessness even before we're saved. And the pastor is just as helpless as every one of you. So at the moment of salvation, God gave us 39 irrevocable absolutes plus one. And we're all helpless and we all receive these things when we believe in Christ. And we did not earn them. We did not deserve them. We are helpless. We are hopeless. And we are all useless, no matter what your spiritual gift. You're useless, helpless, without the grace of God. And that's why the Apostle Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And the Apostle Paul was the greatest apostle ever, yet he knew it was from the grace of God. And it had nothing to do with him or his personality or anything else. Now Ephesians 3, 7 and 3, 8 emphasizes the fact that every minister of the gospel every pastor teacher is the product of the grace of God so Ephesians 3 7 Ephesians 3 7 and 3 8 emphasizes the fact that every minister of the gospel 
Every pastor teacher is the product of the grace of God. Has nothing to do with his personality. Has nothing to do with his looks. Has everything to do with, with what happened at his salvation. And at the point of his salvation, the male received the gift of pastor teacher. Maybe a few of you might have it. Maybe one of you. Maybe none of you. Who knows? But if you have the gift of pastor teacher, you'll understand what is involved with it shortly. So there's no way the Apostle Paul would have been the greatest communicator ever without the grace of God. Even though he was one of the greatest young men in all of Judaism, he started out as the greatest young man in Judaism. In his 20s, he had memorized the Old Testament. In his 20s, he had memorized the Old Testament. I said it twice just so you could think about it. How many of you memorized the Old Testament? None of us. We don't have the brains to do it. I haven't and you haven't. And if you have, cite to me the Old Testament so I can marvel at you. And so the Apostle Paul, even before he was an apostle, even before he was saved, memorized the Old Testament as a man in his 20s. He reminds me much of Napoleon Bonaparte who in his late 20s led the French vast armies. And by the way, they did not make an issue out of his age being in his late 20s. They followed him to victory. And then it got a little too big for his britches, and then he lost. So Paul was so strong in Judaism, he actually became a murderer. And yet God, in his fantastic grace, gave the opportunity for Paul to believe in Christ on the Damascus Road. And when he believed in Christ, he received the gift of apostleship. And there has never been a greater gift than the gift of apostleship. When you're born again, that's when you receive your spiritual gift. You might not know about it, but you receive it. You come to know about your spiritual gift when you reach a point of spiritual self-esteem, a point of a personal sense of destiny. Then you understand what your spiritual gift is all about, whether it be helps or pastor teacher. So by birth, the Apostle Paul was a Jew. And also by birth, the Apostle Paul was the greatest Roman citizen ever. He became the greatest Roman citizen ever. Now in verse 8 of Ephesians 3, 7 and 8, Ephesians 3, 8, To me, the very least of all saints, this grace has been given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable, the unfathomable wealth of Christ. Now, I forgot to announce that today we're going to have one message, not two. Everybody's here, so that's fine. We're going to have one long message, and forget the break. It, it won't be that long, but it'll be about as long as if we threw a break in there. It, I think it's a waste, and we can get home earlier. Maybe I'll do it later. I'll see how it works out. I'll see if you can keep your attention for this long, and if you can, then I'll keep doing it this way. If not, we'll have a break. So let's look in your Bibles at 1 Timothy 1, 12 through 14. 1 Timothy 1, 12. Now in Ephesians 3, 8 again, it says, To me, the very least of these saints, the Apostle Paul, this grace has been given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable, the unfathomable wealth of Christ. And that's what the Apostle Paul has. And never has the wealth of Christ been presented as it has been presented to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul had these things presented to him in a way that has never been presented before until Colonel Thien came on the scene. 1 Timothy 1.12 I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has poured power filling of the Spirit. Two power options. Who has poured power into me because he considered me faithful. And that's the key word. A pastor must be faithful in his teaching of the Word of God. It must be daily. And he must be faithful in teaching it daily. You know, you might teach once a Sunday and somebody might get a little bit out of it. But by the time the next Sunday rolls around, you've forgotten about everything that man said. Probably everything. You might hold on to a little bit of it, and that's great. But for the most part, you cannot learn Sunday to Sunday. Impossible. There must be daily teaching, and the Apostle Paul taught daily. 
He didn't teach daily to the same group of people. He went from country to country. He was a missionary and an apostle. He had a different uh, function. But he did teach daily wherever he went. And that's very important for all of us to understand. So the emphasis of Paul is on the grace of God and he considered me faithful. That is the Apostle Paul putting me into the ministry. And even though I was formerly, as an unbeliever, a blasphemer, persecutor, violent aggressor, I was shown mercy because I acted in unbelief. As an unbeliever, he acted in unbelief and he was deep into religion. But he came out of it as the worst of sinners. And the grace of our Lord was more abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. So there's never have been and there never will be a man in the ministry who is so much a product of the abundance of grace than the Apostle Paul. There never will be a man like the Apostle Paul. He was given more grace. He was given more grace than you can ever imagine. A man who went from the worst sinner ever to the greatest believer ever, he had to be given grace. And that's application to us. Maybe we think low of ourselves. Maybe we think that we don't really measure up in terms of the spiritual life. Have some encouragement from Paul. Paul started out as an unbeliever, the worst of unbelievers, the worst sinner ever in the deepest of religions. And he became the greatest believer ever. And you have the chance to do this exact same thing. So don't think lowly of yourself. Never feel guilty. That's not part of the plan of God. Move forward as royal family. So what you've screwed up? We've all screwed up. We've all messed up in some way. And so did Paul. we got to get over that. We've got to get over our inferi inferiority complexes. And we've got to move on. We've got to get over our superiority complexes too in terms of being jealous and envious and all that junk. We've got to get over those things and move on and move on and press on in the Word of God. And that's what the Apostle Paul did. Let's now look at Hebrews 13:17. Hebrews 13:17. Now in Hebrews 13 it talks about how in the local church the final authority is the pastor. And it's very important to be authority oriented. The pastor is the ultimate authority. You might not like the pastor, but he's still the authority. You might not like the way he teaches, you might think he gets a little too personal, but he's still the authority. And Apostle Paul got personal with Peter, as we noted in Galatians, and he had to. So the pastor is the ultimate authority, and he establishes his authority through the teaching of the Word. How does a pastor teacher establish his authority? Through the teaching of the Word of God, the accurate teaching of the Word of God. And whether that pastor be weak or strong, he is the final authority. Even if he's incorrect, he's the final authority. What do you do if a pastor's incorrect and he's not teaching correctly? Do you make a fuss about it? No. You should use impersonal love and walk out and never come back. Separate. You must separate yourselves from those who are legalistic. You must separate yourselves from those pastors who do not teach doctrine. And if you think I don't measure up in my teaching of doctrine, you should walk out of here and never come back. I encourage you to if that's your thought. Because if you have such a thought, you see the only reason you should leave a church is because they're not teaching you doctrine. That's the only reason. People come up with all different kinds of reasons. They want to attack the pastor because he stepped on their toes, etc. And you think he did it on purpose. Well, that's ridiculous. A pastor who's teaching the Word of God never does it on purpose. He does it out of love for you. And I don't know your life. And if something steps on your toes, I don't know what it really is. You might think I know, but I'm not that smart. And the fact that you give me credit enough to think that I know exactly how your life is, if you give me that much credit, you think more of me than I think of myself. I have no clue. Nobody's told me about your life. And uh, for the most part, they have not. So I don't really know and I don't really care. I'm just here to teach the Word. So now Hebrews 13, 17. 
Remember those who rule you who communicate the word of God to you. Remember those who rule you who communicate the word of God to you. Pastor teacher has authority. And this is what Hebrews 13, 17 is saying. Carefully consider the issue. The issue of what? The issue of their way of life. Now does that mean you have to watch me and see what my way of life is and to see what I'm doing on my off time and to see if I'm behaving correctly? No. What it means is you have to know I'm studying and teaching. My way of life is study and teach, study and teach. You would be bored if you watched my life. I guarantee it, you would be bored. You would see me sitting in front of a computer and every now and then jumping into a pool to get some sun. And it would be boring to you. So you consider the way of life and that and then what's it go on to say? Imitate their doctrine. Don't imitate me, imitate the word of God. Don't imitate me, imitate the word of God. That's what it means. And what it also is means in Hebrews thirteen seven is that it's not the man, it's the message. It has nothing to do with the man. Maybe you don't like the man. Maybe you think the man's a jerk. Whatever you think about the man, it's not the man, it's the message. And are you getting the message? And I hope you're getting the message. It has nothing to do with me. I'm a nobody. I'm a nothing, just like everyone else. So Hebrews 13, 17. Keep obeying those pastors who themselves are ruling over you and submit to their authority. <coughs> That is, to submit to the teaching of the Word of God. For they keep watching over your souls as those who will render an account. That means every pastor will render an account at the Bema immediately following the resurrection of the church. And I will have to keep an account of you and you'll have to keep an account of yourself. And if you hear me groan, you'll know why. You failed. So, for they keep watching over your souls as those who will render an account at the Bema. Keep obeying them in order that they may do this accounting with plus H. And that means tranquility of the soul. And that means when you respond to me, I'm able to be tranquil. When you respond to me, I'm able to uh, lessen the uh, barking at you. When you're responding to me, I'm able to be nicer. And when you're reacting, I'm not. I have to push it harder. So the best uh, environment is for a pastor to be around a bunch of positive people who don't make any guff about it and who don't make personal issues out of it. If you make a personal issue out of it, that's your fault, not mine. Do you think I go home and think about you and talk about you? Not often. <laughs> <laughs> So Hebrews 13, 17, keep obeying those pastors who themselves are ruling over you and submit to their authority, the teaching of the word of God. For they keep watching over your souls as those who will render an account at the Bema. Keep obeying them in order that they may do this accounting with plus H and not with groaning. It's a lot better to teach without any groaning, to know that people are responding and not rejecting for this will be unprofitable for who? You, not me. It's unprofitable for you if you start groaning against the authority. It's not unprofitable for me unless I react to you for groaning. What we must look at now regarding the pastor teacher and regarding all spiritual gifts of the Old Testament and in the tribulation and in the millennium is Isaiah 54:17. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 54, 17. And this is written specifically for those in authority, for those who teach. People often use it as a promise for themselves, and that's fine if it makes you feel better, but really, it's for the pastor only. And it's for the prophet only. It's for the person in authority only over a congregation or, at this point, over a synagogue. Isaiah 54:17 Isaiah 54:17 And this should scare about anyone out of gossip toward a pastor anyway you might gossip about others but this should scare you right out of gossiping about a pastor 
Because it's going to do you no good. It's going to do me a lot of good, but it's going to do you no good. When somebody gossips about a pastor, it causes me to be blessed. If you're gossiping about me, I'm blessed. Do you want me to be blessed? Go home and gossip. And I'll be blessed and I'll smile as the blessings pour down and you will frown as the cursing comes down. Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. Against who? Communicator of the Word of God. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue, that's where gossip comes from, the tongue, and every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will condemn. When? At the Bema. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, those who communicate. Whether it be a communicator in the Old Testament or a communicator today as a pastor teacher. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their vindication is from me. That is from God. God will vindicate the pastor teacher who's been gossiped about. And then it goes on, declares the Lord. Now since the pastor's authority is Bible teaching, his ministry does not violate the individual's priesthood and I've never violated yours. You have a right to show up whenever you wish. You have a right to leave whenever you wish. Uh, you have a right to do whatever you want. And I do not violate your priesthood. I might step on your toes, but I don't violate your priesthood. You represent yourself before the Lord. Now let's take a look at 1 Peter 5.2. 1 Peter 5.2. Also dealing with the gift of pastor teacher and what he should do. And the whole emphasis throughout the Bible is authority. And the fact that if you bulk against authority, you're in trouble. And I don't mean just my authority. I mean everybody's authority. If you are one to not be authority-oriented, if you're one to make an issue out of a teacher because they don't treat you right, you're not authority-oriented. That teacher is your authority. She might be insane. I've had some insane teachers, but they were my authority, and I never complained Except one time with an algebra teacher, I did complain. But that was my fault. She's the authority. She shouldn't have been a teacher, but she was, and she was the authority. And so you don't complain about authority. You just, uh, you just have to be under it. That's why God invented authority for our benefit. First Peter 5.2 Feed the flock of God among you. Feed the flock of God among you, and that means voluntarily, according to the will of God. You have to teach voluntarily. If, you're gonna, if you think you have the gift of pastor teacher, when you teach, teach voluntarily. Don't teach in thinking that you're going to get a big income. Don't teach in thinking that you're going to get a lot of praise. You never will, unless you compromise. You never will get any praise. You do it voluntarily, according to the will of God. According to the will of God must means that you must teach the Word of God accurately and with accuracy. So let's look at 2 Timothy 4.1 through 4.4. 2 Timothy 4.1 through 4.4 also deals with the gift of pastor-teacher. And some of you may have the gift. Some of you may think you have the gift and do not. Some of you may want the gift and will never have it because it's given to you at the point of salvation. So you need to understand how you must act if you do have it. What you must do if you have it. If you have a gift of pastor teacher, you must be single-minded. You cannot go astray. The only thing that is important in your life as a pastor should be Bible doctrine. If you can't uh, listen to the Word of God, you'll never make it. 2 Timothy 4.1 In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead? And in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. This is the charge to the pastor. In fact, this was the Apostle Paul's charge to Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in season. That means be prepared at the appointed times of study. 
That means be prepared so that I can get up and teach tonight, tomorrow, the next day, and the next day. Be prepared for that. That's in season. That are the appointed times that have been uh, made for you to come to Bible class. Be prepared in season and out of season. That means if a pastor is walking through Walmart and somebody shows an interest in the gospel, you're prepared out of season. Not time for you to teach, but you can give the gospel right there. So be prepared in season and out of season. Correct. Rebuke. And encourage. Now the, the two things that most people don't like is the correction and the rebuke. The encouragement, they can handle that. But most people cannot handle the correction or the rebuke. They get upset and they think it's personal and it is never personal. If you make it personal, well it is personal because you're failing in some way. I'm not going home thinking about you personally and thinking, ooh, I really rebuked so and so. I rebuke everybody. I correct everybody. And I encourage everybody. The thing about being a pastor, if you want to be a pastor, you get no credit for the encouragement and you get a lot of flack for the correction and reproof. And that just goes along with the job. With great patience and careful instruction. What's it mean with great patience? That means you have to repeat very often. You have to repeat and repeat with great patience because people don't learn the first time around. I never did and you never will. Now the pastor already knows it and one thing I have to understand and any pastor has to understand is people don't get it the first time around. Sometimes it takes five times before they even begin to absorb it. And they might not understand a thing the first time I teach it, or the second, or the third, but then the fourth they start to get something out of it. Because they've finally grown to the point where they can understand a point that I was making that they never understood before. So the pastor must learn to have patience and be able to repeat. And I've repeated very often. I repeat much less than my pastor did, but I need to start repeating more because I've understood and have come to understood through this what I've been doing that people don't catch on the first time. It takes repetition, repetition, repetition. And some people get mad at repetition. They think they know it the first time and that's just plain arrogance. It doesn't hurt to review anyway. So with great patience and careful instruction, verse 3, For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. What time is that? This time! And the time of Paul. This is not a prophecy verse. The time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine simply means the trends of history. And in the trends of history, we are at a point in our country when people will not put up with sound doctrine. And there came a time in the Middle Ages when people would not put up with sound doctrine. What happened? A plague ravaged Europe. And half of the population, you hear a third, that's incorrect, half of the population of Europe died from the plague. And every family was affected by the plague. Oh, they were prosperous right before the plague. It's kind of like today. You see, the Roman Empire had just fallen. And here's uh, these group of Europeans, and there's, it's pretty much all Catholic. And uh, suddenly there becomes a generation that cares not for the Word of God and they go in for ritual. Ritual without reality. And then boom, they are struck with the plague. Just like boom, we could be struck with the bird flu. could happen to us. Right now we're prosperous. Tomorrow we may not be. I hope we are, but we may not be. And this is part of punishment when people do not put up with sound doctrine. And today, if you are going to interpret history, you might be a history student and love history. The best way for you to interpret history is to know the Word of God. Because you will understand that when people go away from the Word of God and go away from grace, history turns bad. And if you're a great history student and you've studied a lot of history, look at it in this light. Look at it in the light of... Was there a lot of doctrine being taught at this time in this period when there was disaster? Answer, no, there was not. During times of prosperity, was there a lot of doctrine being taught? Answer, yes, there was. 
And you can look through history and you can see that. It's absolutely phenomenal. And you can see God at work in every single generation. And you can see God blessing for the pivot. And you can see God cursing for no pivot. So there will come a time when, when, when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Again, for the time will come when, when, when men will not put up with sound doctrine, men and women of course. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. What's that mean? They're going to turn on channel 6, that's what it means. And they're going to watch pastor after pastor get up and make a lot of nonsense and get emotional. And they're just going to listen to what their itching ears want to hear. And if they get their toes stepped on, well, they won't listen to that pastor. They'll hop to a pastor who's so sweet he could never step on their toes, yet someday he will. And then you'll hop to another pastor. And guess what? Every pastor you hop to, you are gathering unto yourself a great number of teachers to itch your ear. And it's not a pastor's job to itch your itchy ear. It's a pastor's job to teach you doctrine. And if your toes get stepped on, he has to step out of the way and say it's from the Holy Spirit. Forget it. And I don't care how offended you are. Forget it. That is the pastor's job. Not to itch people's ears. I'm not here to pull your hair aside and then itch your ear, big or little. I'm not here to do that. So verse 4. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. That's channel 6 for you. Turn aside to myths. Turn aside to faith healing. Turn aside to tongues, all myths. Turn aside to this, that, and the other. They will turn their ears away from the truth. Why? The truth hurts. As Jack Nicholson said, you can't handle the truth. <laughs> and you'll turn aside from the truth and you'll turn aside to a bunch of myths. But, verse 5, but you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, referring to the pastor. Do the work of an evangelist. That is, when unbelievers come in here, I must give the gospel. Distar discharge all the duties of your ministry. And that means to delegate authority. Delegate authority to those who make MP3s delegate authority to a deacon or deacons delegate authority to others because a pastor can't do it all discharge and that was uh, verse 5 but you keep your head in all situations endure hardship do the work of evangelists discharge all of the duties of your ministry now what you need to understand about a pastor is he's not a normal person He's not normal in any sense of the word. He may look normal, he may talk normal, he may act normal, but his lifestyle is not normal. He goes up into a cave and studies and studies and studies and studies until his brain pops out. He must study and teach, study and teach, study and teach. He is not normal, and as a result, he becomes a target of vilification. And if you don't understand the pastor or the gift of pastor-teacher, you will vilify the pastor, especially if he's doing his job. And you'll never come to learn God's will. And that's why we're studying the gift of pastor-teacher so you can understand my job and so that you can understand your job being as part of a congregation. Now, a pastor-teacher is an undeserving male. No pastor-teacher deserves the gift. A pastor teacher is an undeserving male who's been graced out by the gift given by God the Holy Spirit at the moment of salvation. The pastor teacher is not to be worshipped. Don't ever worship me. I don't really feel threatened by anyone worshipping me now. But don't worship me. And the pastor is not to be despised. Now that I might feel threatened by. A pastor is not to be worshipped and a pastor is not to be despised. And I don't, tell, I don't care if he teaches a good message. And I don't care if he teaches a bad message. I don't care if he's Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, 
you do not despise a pastor. If you don't like what he says, walk out. Leave and never come back. And walk out with your mouth shut. It's as if you've stitched your mouth together so that you will not talk about that pastor as you leave. And you think I would ever go to a church and hang around a pastor who's not teaching anything that's worth anything and try to make trouble? No. I'll just shut my mouth and go home. Listen to a tape instead. So a pastor teaches an undeserving male who's been graced out by the gift given by God the Holy Spirit. And the believer in the church has the option of rejecting the message or accepting the message. But the believer never, ever has the right to, mal to malign or to judge the pastor. Whether he's a good pastor or a bad pastor, it doesn't matter. You have no right to malign or judge the pastor. Because the pastor is a man like everyone else. He's no worse than anyone and he's no better than anyone else. He's simply been given a gift by God the Holy Spirit. So it's the content of the message that should make you a hearer of the Word of God. Listen to the content. Don't bother with the personality. It's the content that matters. And when you tamper with the pastor, you invite the wrath of God upon yourself. And not because the pastor is better than you, but because you've rejected authority. And you can reject any type of authority and have the wrath of God come down on you. You teenagers reject the authority of your parents and the wrath of God will come down on you harder than you can even imagine. You end up like that poor boy I saw in the paper who ran into the wall playing around with his motorcycle in the parking lot. I saw on the front page of the Anderson paper and just revved that engine up and ran right into the wall and broke his spine. Dead he was right there. A believer in heaven now. Well, at least I think he is. They said he attended church every time the doors were open, so I imagine he was a believer. Maybe the only thing he ever did was invite Christ in his heart. Who knows? I believe he's a believer, and I hope he was. But uh, if you go against your parents, you'll end up dead just like that. In a heartbeat. Well, that wasn't impressive. In a heartbeat. <laughs> dead. Why? Well, your parents tell you, well, don't go out tonight. And you say, well, I'm going to go out anyway. I'm going to sneak out my window and go out. Just like the young people I told you about before. He wanted to go out with his girlfriend. Mother said, don't you go out. And he said, I'm going out. Happened to be below 32 degrees. Started raining. The, rose fro the road froze over and he flipped over and died. Both of them. Why? He rejected authority. If he had accepted authority, he would have been alive and sleeping in his bed. Don't reject authority. Do not think it's demeaning to accept authority either. Your parents have authority over you because they want to protect you. And uh, that's just the way it is. And you have to follow authority. And if you never get under the authority of your parents, you'll never get under the authority of a pastor. You'll never make it in the workplace because you'll be against the authority of your boss. You've got to understand authority and that God put it in place for a reason. And he put the gift of pastor-teacher in place for a reason. You can't go through the Bible and read it and look at commentaries and learn it on your own. Impossible! If that were possible, I would not have to have a job. And you might wish I wouldn't have a job, but so what? I would, there would be no pastor-teacher if you could simply open the Bible and look down at a commentary and say, well, the commentary says this, the verse says this, well, I'll go with that. Why? Because you have to be under an authority, that's why. You have to have somebody shoving it in your face so that you can look at it and chew on it. Whether you believe it or not is your choice. So the pastor teacher who teaches doctrine brings out, and this is a principle, the pastor teacher who teaches doctrine brings out the best in a congregation and he brings out the worst in a congregation. And for a pastor who's a good pastor, there is no in-between. There is no, well, maybe he's good, maybe he's not. There is I hate him and there is I love him. And that's it. A good pastor teacher brings out the best in a congregation and the worst and there's no in between. You're either going to hate me because you hate the message or you're going to love me because you love the message. And it brings out the best in the congregation or it brings out the worst. 
There's no middle ground. I don't care how small the congregation is, there's no middle ground. I don't care how small the congregation is, you're always going to have somebody who's going to hate you, who's going to despise you, who's going to want to rip you apart. That's just that's part of the territory. So every pastor, regardless of his personality or the size of his congregation, he must be found faithful in teaching the Word of God. And that's what the verse says. You must be found faithful. And if there's anything that I am, it's faithful. So I know I'm doing my job. If you hate me for doing my job, keep on hating, I'll keep on being blessed. So every, every pastor, regardless of his personal or his a personal personality or the size of his congregation, he must be found to be faithful in the teaching of the Word of God. Look at Colossians 1 7. Colossians 1 7. This describes a pastor. Now, Epaphras is who is mentioned here, and Epaphras is not an apostle, he is a pastor teacher. Epaphras is a pastor teacher, he's not an apostle, but he's a dear fellow servant. Colossians 1 7. Now, Colossians is one of these weird deals in which the Apostle Paul was never face to face with the Colossians. Actually, Epaphras did all the work for the Apostle Paul, but he did write them. But he never saw them face to face. So, so much for face to face teaching. Colossians 1 7. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful. Minister of Christ on our behalf. Faithful is the key word there. Faithful is the key word. Epaphras was faithful in that he taught, he taught doctrine on a consistent basis. Whether it was daily or not, I don't know, but it was consistent. And the people were learning and growing in grace and in knowledge. So what Paul is getting at is why would you gossip about a or malign a pastor who's faithful like Epaphras? The faithfulness of a pastor demonstrates the love of a pastor for his congregation. The fact that I hold Bible class every day is because I'm demonstrating to you a love. Do you think I want to drag myself up here every day? Not really. But I do it out of love. So why would you gossip and malign a pastor who's faithful? The faithfulness of a pastor demonstrates the love of a pastor for his congregation. And of course, whether you know it or not, I love you more than you could ever begin to understand by the fact that I teach you every day. I want you to get with the word. I'm not here to pick fights. I don't want to have a fight with anybody. Fighting's stupid. Fighting to me is like Jerry Springer. It just makes no sense to me. Nothing's accomplished. And by the way, we'll note a verse that deals with how a pastor should avoid such things, such trivial controversies. So 2 Timothy 2.23 is what we'll talk about, these foolish controversies. People are always offended by little things and they want to talk about these little things and they want to be offended. Most, most people who are offended want to be offended. They want to be. They want to be hurt. They want their feelings to be hurt. That's part of psychosis. 2 Timothy 2.23 2 Timothy 2.23 now this is for Timothy who is a pastor, a young pastor of a church. He's young in age and he's young in experience and he really doesn't know how to handle these people. So Paul tries to give him a helping hand with these verses. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. A pastor should have nothing to do with quarrels. Avoid them. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. A pastor teacher must not quarrel. Therefore, it's going to happen, but he should avoid it. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. He must be kind to everyone. And that is to treat everyone with the same amount of respect. And I do. He must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Now, if you're going to be a pastor teacher and you have a tendency to be resentful and if you have a tendency to react to everyone who crosses you, you'll never make it. Because when you get behind a pulpit 
There is always somebody, I don't care how small the congregation is, there's always somebody who's going to resent you and there's always somebody who's going to want to quarrel and you can't let your mind get in that state or you'll drive yourself nuts. If you make everything personal behind the pulpit and if somebody resents you and you make that a personal issue, you'll drive yourself crazy. Because there's always going to be somebody in a church who resents you. Always. What do you do? Leave them in the Lord's hands. That's exactly what you do. You don't mess with them. You just say, God, you take care of them. And he'll do a better job than you could ever do. By the way, there's also something called an imprecatory prayer. If you don't know what that is, it would send chills up and down your spine if you knew what it was. Imprecatory prayer is a prayer a pastor can offer for somebody causing trouble in the congregation. And it should, uh, we'll study it one day. Imprecatory prayer. So 2 Timothy 2.23, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach and not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant him, that is repentance, a change of mind, metanoiao, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. So that's part of what you need to do as a pastor. So continuing, when a pastor fulfills his ministry, one thing should be noted. One thing should be noted. If a pastor is doing his job, you need to notice something. There's going to come a day when Jesus Christ will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and those who remain will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And that's the moment where, when we're all going to be evaluated, not by me, but by the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to evaluate me. He's going to evaluate you. He's going to evaluate everyone. Are you ready for that? Just think about it to yourself. You ready to be evaluated by the Lord Jesus Christ himself? Do you think you've executed the spiritual life? Or do you think you've wasted your time in gossip, maligning, and judging? Have you wasted your time in the old sin nature? Or have you been living the spiritual life? If you waste your time in the old sin nature, in gossip, maligning, and judging, and those sins that are the worst, our Lord Jesus Christ will evaluate you and put you to shame. And then as a pastor, if I am your right pastor, you'll stand right beside me and I'll have to groan. Oh, so-and-so didn't make it. But it's all of this is for your benefit because when the pastor fulfills his duty, you must understand that you were given every chance to grow in grace and in knowledge and did not take it. And if you did not take it, that is not you, but the majority of people who do not take the chance. If you do not take the chance, you're going to be ashamed at the Bema. Hebrews 6.10 Hebrews 6.10 We're going to go through several different passages now that deal with rewards. And they deal with, well, they deal still with the gift of pastor teacher, but they also deal with the rewards involved in having the gift of pastor teacher. And they deal with the rewards involved with the congregation who goes forward in the Word of God. Hebrews 6.10 God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown Him as you have helped His people and continue to help them. This is definitely a reference to the pastor teacher. And God is not unjust to the pastor teacher. He will not forget the pastor teacher and his work. And the love you've shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help him. The best way I can show my love for God is to show help towards you by teaching you every opportunity I can and every opportunity you want to avail yourself to it. Now let's look at First Peter 5.4. 1 Peter 5.4 Now 1 Peter 5.4 is also a reference to the pastor teacher and the pastor teacher receives a special crown if he executes the spiritual life. 1 Peter 5.4 If the pastor executes the spiritual life he will receive a special crown. 1 Peter 5.4 You too will receive a special crown 
but a different one not like the one of the pastor if you want to cut the air on you can if you please don't get too intimidated 1 Peter 5 4 and when the chief shepherd appears and when the chief shepherd appears you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away the chief shepherd is our Lord Jesus Christ and our chief shepherd will appear at the resurrection and when the chief shepherd appears the shepherds the pastor teacher will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away that is if they've executed the unique spiritual life number one and number two taught it to their congregation you might have the gift of pastor teacher but no one's ever going to listen to you because of these times of apostasy and you might think to yourself and get very frustrated and say you know what I know I have the gift but nobody's ever going to listen to me don't worry about it you'll still receive the crown as long as you execute your spiritual life God will honor you and not only will he honor you on this earth if you end up as a pastor teacher who never has a congregation God will honor you he'll honor you in a way that you'll be blessed in other ways you'll be blessed in business you'll be blessed in whatever you do whatever if you decide to make a business God will bless you in it you'll be blessed doubly and whatever you do if uh, the nation is apostate and it is and I dare say that there are a lot of people with the gift of pastor teacher who will never be able to use that gift in this generation because there's so much apostasy and nobody wants to listen to doctrine just look around you and you'll note not look at the people around you but look around and notice the lack of people and that just shows that we are in a an apostate generation and one day the North Koreans will launch that missile and we'll miss it and it'll blow us up. I hope not. Why don't we just blow that thing up right now? Have you heard about that on the news? North Koreans? <laughs> you haven't heard about it? The North Koreans want to shoot a missile at us. And it has the capability, it's a ballistic missile, it has the capability of carrying a nuclear warhead and it can reach San Francisco, Seattle, can't reach over here thank God but it can reach Seattle it can reach all the way to about the midpoint of the country it cannot reach the East Coast and they are about to shoot it they haven't shot it yet because I don't think George Bush would put up with that I hope not but uh, they're they're threatening it and uh, this is part of warfare and we're in a world war and part of the reason why we're in a world war is the fact that pastors are not teaching the Word of God just look at history why is history going down, down, down? Why does it seem that there's war and conflict everywhere? And there is. Because there's no pivot of mature believers anymore. It's gone. And because it's gone, God will punish, punish, punish. And that's all God can do from His justice. <laughs> Let's look at 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 4, 8. 2 Timothy 4, 7 and 4, 8 deals with the Apostle Paul. And this is the Apostle Paul right before he dies. The Apostle Paul has his head chopped off by Nero, by the way. A very painless death. Nero is just going to order his beheading and uh, Paul had finished his work and Paul's head will tumble off his head and he'll go straight to heaven. Painless death. Some of you would like to go to die in your sleep. Well, getting your head chopped off is about just as good. You don't feel a thing. Cuts right through that spinal cord and you feel nothing. 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. Apostle Paul was confident at this point. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. What day? The day of resurrection during the Bema. And not only to me, not only to Paul, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. All of you. All of you who long for the appearing of Christ. What's that mean? Well, if you have not executed the spiritual life, you don't long for the appearing of Christ. You might make some uh, verbalizations about it and say, well, I wish the rapture would occur today. But you really don't if you think about it. Because at that point, you will receive your rewards or you will not. 
And if you are a loser believer, you won't receive a thing. So you can ask yourself, the rapture may occur tonight at 8 o'clock. Ask yourself, it may not, we don't know. But ask yourself, if at 8 o'clock Jesus Christ comes down and calls us all up into heaven, are you ready? Will, do you, are you confident like the Apostle Paul is confident that in store for you will be a crown of righteousness? <coughs> if you're not confident, keep plugging. Eventually you'll develop that confidence from a personal sense of destiny. Let's look at Revelation 2.10. Revelation 2.10. Also dealing with rewards. Dealing with the fact that if you execute this spiritual life, you have on store for you and on tap for you some rewards. Now your motivation should not be that I'm going to do this because I've got rewards in store. Your motivation should always be love for God. And the only way you can execute this spiritual life is love for God. Anybody who executes a spiritual life just looking for a crown, it's like somebody who's working just to receive a paycheck that's not the way God works you have to understand you will receive a crown if you execute the spiritual life but executing the spiritual life comes from your volition and it comes from love for God not love for rewards love for God you'll receive the rewards but you receive it because of your love for God Revelation 2.10 do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer and all of us will suffer when we execute the unique spiritual life. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. We haven't had much of that occur in the New Testament. Uh, well, in the New Testament it occurred, but in this era, not much of that has occurred because we live in a nation of freedom and thank God for it. We are never, we, no one has been put into jail because they believed in Christ. Not yet anyway, not that I know of. People have had their microphones cut off because they talked about Jesus Christ, but they were not thrown in jail. We're heading in that direction, but that hasn't occurred yet. So the devil will put some of you in prison to test you. And you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. If you're faithful in the word of God, you will receive the crown of life. James 1.12 James 1.12 This also deals with the, the crowns and all the rewards that people receive when they execute the spiritual life. Don't spend your time gossiping about a pastor. Spend your time executing the spiritual life. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's a bad pastor, a good pastor, a mediocre pastor. Don't spend your time gossiping about anyone. Spend your time executing the spiritual life. Don't spend your time in the cosmic system. You might have a different area of weakness. Some people have a weakness of gossip, maligning, and judging. Other people have a weakness of alcoholism, drug abuse, and fornication. Whatever your weakness is, stop it. Rebound and keep moving. And if you fail, rebound and keep moving because we're all going to fail over and over and over again. So James 1.12, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Who receives the crown of life? Those who love God the Father. How do you know if you love God the Father? Your interest in the Word makes it very clear. If you love the Word of God, you love God the Father. If you don't love the Word of God, you don't love Him. If you think something's more important than the Word of God, you'll never make it. And this is something that you must come to understand in that you have to live your life in the light of eternity because you must understand at one point you're going to be evaluated. What do you do before a test at school? You cram for it, don't you? You study real hard. Or if you're a good stu uh, student, you've been studying all along so that you don't have to cram for it. You've just been studying every day with the teacher. And then on test day, you can review and you don't have to spend much time on it because you've been studying the whole time. What happens if you haven't been studying? You're going to get nervous and you're going to cram for it. 
What happens when uh, people start to die? They get nervous and they start cramming for what's about to happen. But they don't know what to do. They get nervous and they get frazzled. And they think that uh, cramming for it, well, they just have no clue what to do. And they'll never make it. You can't cram for this test. You might say, well, I'm young. I'll get back with doctrine later. You don't know when your death will come. It may come at age 30, and that's not too far away for some of you. For some of you, you've passed that. And so maybe you'll die at age 50, and that's not too far away. Or age 70, and that's not too far away. And you have to come to a point where you must live your life in the light of eternity and understand, don't cram for the test. Get it now and get it daily so that you don't have to worry about it when the time comes. And the time will come. Whether it be by your death or whether it be by resurrection, the time's coming. And you better be prepared through the Word of God. And don't get upset. And don't uh, try to run people down. And don't uh, get into fights and all this nonsense. Disregard all of that. Go for the crown. Go for the goal. And that's why the Apostle Paul says these things. So invisible impact plus passing evidence testing will result in decorations based on a Roman system of decoration. This is how the Apostle Paul describes it. It's the highest decoration possible. It's like the Medal of Honor. When you execute the unique spiritual life, it's as if you've been pinned with the Medal of Honor. And there's the crown of glory. Now the crown of glory is exclusively for pastors, but you have your own crown, crown of righteousness and other things that you can receive if you execute the spiritual life. And you can think of it as a crown of glory. And you can think of it as a medal of honor. I saw on the news today where people are ordering medal of honor things on the internet, sticking it on them, and then acting like they're a great war he hero. Well, you can't get away with, with that with God. People try it. People go to church and try to act holy and put a medal of honor on themselves. It's not going to work. God knows, and you'll receive what you, are, what you are going to receive through the means of executing the spiritual life. Let's now look at Philippians 4.1. <coughs> Philippians 4.1. Philippians 4.1 Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, that is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Now, the Apostle Paul is going to receive a crown because of his execution of the spiritual life and because he has fulfilled his duty as a minister in teaching the Word of God. Now what we get to next is the order of the morning star. The order of the morning star is listed in Revelation 2.26. The order of the morning star, and that's for all believers. That's all believers. Revelation 2.26. Every be not all believers, but every believer who executes the spiritual life. Losers do not receive the order of the morning star. Revelation 2.26. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end. I will give authority over the nations. What nations? The nations in the millennium. That's part of your reward. You will rule in the millennium. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end. That is execute the spiritual life to the end. In spite of insults, in spite of being offended, in spite of whatever... You execute the spiritual life to the end. I will give authority over the nations, the millennial nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter, not just he, but he and she. You ladies who go to execute the unique spiritual life, you too will be placed in rulership over nations. There is no gender in the New Testament. There is in the Old, but not in the New Testament. And whether you're a female or a male, you can still, if you execute this spiritual life, end up with the reward of leading a nation in the millennium. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He or she will rule them with an iron scepter. 
he or she will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give him, or she, the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So as part of executing the unique spiritual life, you will receive the order of the morning star, another point of decoration. Now just look at all the losers in the unique spiritual life who don't even know what the unique spiritual life is, who don't even know how to rebound. Look at all these losers and what they're missing out on. They're missing out on the order of the morning star. They're missing out on crowns. They're missing out on everything. The only thing they're going to have is a resurrection body and they're going to stand around and watch you receive all the glory if you execute the spiritual life. But that, again, should not be your motivation. Revelation 3, 4. Revelation 3, 4. Revelation 3, 4 through 3, 6 also deals with uh, some decorations. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. This is the translucent coat of glory. It, comes, it goes over the resurrection body, and it is a coat, a translucent coat of glory. He who overcomes will like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out his name from the book of life, but will acknowledge his name before my Father and his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now what this is referring to is the fact that your name will never be blotted out if you've executed the unique spiritual life. You will be acknowledged before God the Father and the angels as a winner believer. Imagine that. If you execute this spiritual life, one day you will be acknowledged before God the Father, the angels, and everyone else as a winner. Everyone likes approbation lust today and being acknowledged among people, but this is far greater. Being acknowledged by Jesus Christ to God the Father and to all these angels. What it means by saying I will never blot out his name from the book of life means your name will never be blotted out of history. If you've executed the unique spiritual life, you become part of the eternal history book. Now we have famous people in history today. People like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was great in human history, but his name will not be seen in eternal history. People like Johnson, President Johnson, who was considered great as a man, but will never be seen in heaven. He won't even be there. He's burning in hell. And there will be lots of people who were famous in time who will never have part in the history book of heaven. But you, an invisible hero, one who has done nothing but listened to the word of God. Maybe you did nothing in your life except become a janitor. And maybe you worked 40 hours a week as a janitor. The worst type would be a school janitor mopping up throw up. Maybe you're a school janitor. All your life, that's all you do. And you're considered a nothing by everybody. But if you've executed the spiritual life and you go to heaven, you're marked in the eternal history book as the one who saved Client Nation USA for maybe another 50 years. It's phenomenal the impact you can have. Invisible, of course, but it's there. So let's look at invisible heroes. 2 Timothy 2.12 We're almost finished. We've got to go through the order of knighthood and then we'll be finished. Let's look at 2 Timothy 2.12 referring to invisible heroes. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. That disowning has nothing to do with eternal security. We know that. We should know eternal security by now. That means he disowns us from our eternal reward. So if we endure, that is, ex execute the spiritual life, we will also reign with him in leadership in the millennium. If we disown him in that we do not execute the spiritual life, he will also disown us in that we will have no inheritance in heaven. We'll be there, but we'll have no inheritance. Revelation 3.21 again, To him who overcomes, I will give the right 
to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. That's Revelation 3.21. Now again, this is something the disciples even knew. The disciples knew that somebody's going to sit on the left hand of God the Father. Right now, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father. Someone, one person, is going to be given the privilege to sit at the left hand of God the Father. Who is it going to be? We don't know. If I were to guess, I would say the Apostle Paul, but we don't know. Colonel Thing, who knows? You, who knows? We don't know. Whoever executes this spiritual life to the maximum, probably the Apostle Paul would be my guess, will sit at the left hand. And that's why he says this, To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. There's going to be one person who executed the spiritual life far enough to sit with Jesus Christ. Just as I overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. The reason why I think it's the Apostle Paul is because in many cases he said, do as Christ does and do as I do. Meaning he knew he went so far in his spiritual life he could compare himself with Christ. Meaning Jesus Christ lived the unique uh, power experiment of the hypostatic union and the Apostle Paul fulfilled the unique spiritual life of the church age. And both of them, and he actually equals himself with Jesus Christ, not in a blasphemous way, but in a way to say that just as you imitate Christ, imitate me, because I'm fulfilling this spiritual life. That's why I think it's Paul. Who, who would have such gall to say that? And by the way, have it be printed in the Bible, which means it is part of Scripture, which means Paul is one of the greatest ever, if not the greatest. Now, it could be someone else. There's just uh, It doesn't say. We don't know. That's just speculation. And we don't need to speculate because, remember, the disciples decided to speculate. And they said, Tell me, Lord, who's going to sit at your left hand? Is it going to be me? I bet it's going to be me, they would say. Or is it going to be him? No, nah, it's not going to be him. That's the way Peter was. It's going to be me, ain't it, Lord? Yeah, it is. I know me. That's Peter for you. It won't be Peter. I guarantee you it won't be Peter. It won't be me either. Maybe Paul. Who knows? So to him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And what our Lord overcame was a whole lot. We know that. Revelation 2.26. I believe we went over this earlier. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That is for anyone. Anyone who executes the spiritual life, if you overcome to the end, you will have authority over nations. If there is a United States of America after the tribulation, maybe you'll end up being president and that'll be funny. Wouldn't it? I mean, you'll, well, none of us will probably be president. You might. But uh, it, it'd be funny. You, you go to heaven as a janitor and then end up as president of the United States in the millennium. I doubt there will be one, but probably the United States of Mexico is what it will be then. So all of us do have a future in the eternal state. All of us have a future, and this is what we must understand. And some of us will be given the order of knighthood, as uh, described in Revelation 2.17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Look at all these special rewards we can re receive if we execute the spiritual life. So this is the name and the title of the invisible hero. The order of the knighthood is what this is talking about. The order of the knighthood is the name and title of the invisible hero who is recorded in permanent historical record. And this is the historical record of the mature believer and their historical invisible impact. You might not know what your impact is today, but in heaven you'll know it. And if you executed the spiritual life, you'll become part of a history book. You might want to make yourself part of a history book in human terms, but in human terms all that's going to fade away. The only eternal history book will be one created by God with invisible heroes in it, a correct history book. You might think of Ronald Reagan as the uh, great hero of this century, and he is, humanly speaking. 
But in heaven, whether he makes it into the history book or not, we don't know. Maybe some, maybe it'll be Colonel Thiem who was the uh, great perpetuator of this nation in the 80s and 90s and even till this day. It is, not maybe. It is. And his influence and his impact, it's all written in the book for eternity. Oh, he has Alzheimer's now, but when he gets to heaven, he'll remember it all. And he'll uh, right there it'll be a history book. And you could be part of it too. But that, again, should not be your motivation. Your motivation should not be to be part of the eternal history book. Your motivation should not be to receive a crown. Your motivation should be love for God. And God's done so much for us, we should reciprocate. And it should be very easy for us to do so. Revelation 2.7 He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Revelation 2.7 There's also a tree of life. And to those who overcome, to those who execute the unique spiritual life, you'll be able to eat from the tree of life. And that's the paradise of God. Now if you don't make it this far, you will still have a resurrection body. You'll still be happy. But you won't be the happiest person on the block. Now I, I just received my ordination papers and that is to send it back. They might not ordain for two years, for all I know. That's what they're saying. There's not enough people even trying out for it lately. But uh, I got my ordination papers, and ordination is important, and it is part of the Word of God, and ordination is actually the recognition of the spiritual gift of a pastor-teacher. It recognizes certain things about a, about a pastor who has a spiritual gift. First of all, he must be saved by faith. He must have believed in Christ, no inviting Christ anywhere. That's the first requirement, saved by faith. And he must understand that God the Holy Spirit gave him the spiritual gift and he must carry out the duties of the gospel ministry. There are certain candidates and they must be approved and they must hold sound doctrine and therefore uh, ordination is public recognition recognition that he has the ability to defend and to communicate the faith once and for all. So it is a public recognition that the candidate has the character and the personal standards that are above reproach but with both within and without the church. Now God uses prepared men and if you think you have the spiritual gift you must recognize your spiritual gift and in doing so you must be faithful. Maybe you think you have the spiritual gift, but you have no way to use it, and it's males only. None of you females have gift of pastor-teacher. Males only have gift of pastor-teacher. And if you think you have that gift, you must understand that there must be a lifestyle of preparation, preparation. And you say, well, where was your preparation? You didn't go to Bible school. No, I went to something better. Seventeen years of beating my brains out under Colonel Thieme. And it, it really not beating my brains out, just plainly listening and concentrating day in and day out. Can't remember the last time I missed a day. Can Not to be bragging, I just can't remember. Usually I listen to way more than one tape, especially later in my life. Not that I'm old, but later in my life. So there must be a lifestyle of preparation. You must understand that if you think you have the gift of pastor-teacher, maybe you're a young man sitting here today and you think, you know, I think I might have the gift. You must understand it's not a normal life. There's nothing normal about it, but it is a wonderful life. But it's not a normal life. And this means your fellowship with God means a lifetime of study, 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 study until you fall asleep. This means self-discipline. It means to be single-minded. That means you can't be messing around in all this uh, social strife. You can have a social life, but don't... Any pastor who gets involved in social strife, that's different than social life. He's failed. There's no way he can make it. You must be single-minded, in which Bible doctrine has a number one priority in your life. There must be personal recognition that this ministry is from the Word of God. It is not by human talent. If it were by human talent, I wouldn't be here. It is not by a scintillating personality. It is not because someone's a great oratory or has a deep, booming voice. 
It is it, the power is in the word. It is not in the personality. Oh, you could get a good uh, radio speaker who has a deep voice and try to speak, and you'd listen for a while, and then uh, off you'd go somewhere else because the gift has nothing to do with oratory, has nothing to do with talent, has nothing to do with personality, has everything to do with the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and the gift. So the power is in the Word. Now, ordination does not mean you've arrived spiritually. And this is where many pastors who've been ordained have gone astray. They got ordained and they said, I've made it. No, you haven't. You're just getting started. You haven't made it. You've got to study the rest of your life. But they get ordained and they say, I've made it. I don't even have to listen to that man anymore. I've made it. I'll make up my own little charts and stuff now. I've made it. I am the man, they'll think. No, you're not. you got to keep going. And you're no different before ordination than you are after ordination. So ordination does not mean you've arrived spiritually, but it is the starting block of a wonderful journey, and I mean starting. That's where it all starts. It might start before as part of the spiritual gift, functioning before then, and it happens. Rick Knapp taught many years before he was ever ordained at Baraka. Many years, I can tell, but he did. If you've ever heard Rick Knapp's Ephesians, we'll laugh about it after church. But it, it, he couldn't help it. We all have to grow in grace and in knowledge. So, I'm, I'm going to be ordained. I got that. I hope I will. Maybe they'll reject me. Who knows? But I plan to be ordained. And uh, if you decide to reject me after I'm ordained, I'll just say, Houston, I got a problem. Houston, Houston, send me somewhere else. I got a problem. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity of studying these things. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning what we've noted about the gift of pastor-teacher and the preparation and the fact that we ourselves, no matter what our spiritual gift, must be motivated so that we can have all of these wonderful escrow blessings, both for time and eternity. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.